So then Tom leaves. We depart. Uh, we parted ways, and we sort of had a meeting and just like parted ways. And after the meeting, I felt a, a deep sense of relief because this thing is like uh, just sort of been eating at me and been unhappy and not not getting my creative juices out. And that led me to the the realization that all like all of us wanted was creative happiness. Creative happiness always wins, and it will make things sort out. So Carmack wanted creative, his technical creative happiness and to, to do what he wanted to do. John had found in creative happiness, you know, he's getting to do a lot more design, you know, that he's brilliant at instead of just like being hampered by tools and stuff like that. And this allowed me to get out. Unfortunately, uh, I kind of did Rise of Triad, which a number of people like, uh, but it was sort of like Wolfenstein 1.5, you know, <laughs> and I, I, I'm really proud of the death match. The death match has incredible, like crazy things going on, drunk missiles, you know, and flame walls and stuff. Uh, and actually, there's an inside story. Um, the God mode of Rise of the Triad is actually something John did while no <laughs> clipping through walls in Wolfenstein. It's because he would sit there and he'd turn no clip on to like go look at a different room or something, and then he'd just kind of go, Ooh, like he's move. <laughs> I am moving through walls. I will destroy you all. So that kind of turned into to uh, God mode, the and they're like, Ooh, <laughs> I will destroy you. It's kind of an inside joke. Uh, but but the thing the thing I want to get the point I want to make about that though is did rise the triad, but then uh, eventually years later I did get to get my creative yayas completely out uh, with an Acronox, which is a space game which had characters which really told, uh, had a really sense of space, and, and I'm really proud of the writing and the experience of that, so. Yeah, Tom actually was, was uh, developing Prey after Rise of the Triad, and he left uh, 3D Realms, they kind of renamed themselves. Yeah. He left 3D Realms uh, while he was on Prey to help uh, start up Ion Storm so he could make Anachronox, his giant RPG. Yeah, Prey was, Prey was an interesting project. I had sort of a interesting thing that uh, kind of showed up a little bit in Acronox, but it's a series of combined classes, you know, that each kind of contribute to each other, three primaries and two, two that add to each other. And, uh, but uh, that just wasn't creatively working out and the, the team wasn't really happy with it either, the way things were going. Uh, the one thing that I do, do like that is in Prey is Grab Pass, so you can just walk up the wall. I had the, the very perfect image originally in Prey of being able to go like this and throw a grenade and have it bounce on the ceiling like that and wait for something <laughs> like that. So it would be a great death match kind of thing. Anyway. So then, and uh, in Akronox. So then, yeah, so then Tom <laughs> goes and eventually he does an Akronox, but during this time, Tom's gone. Uh, Tom was creative director and he was on the project for 10 months and now there's a void and so we need to hire some other people because I'm not going to finish doing all the levels myself. Because um, I still had, you know, programming to do in the game and, and, and everything but else. But, you know, I just did one, wanted to say one more thing. And that, can you stand over here? All and right. Point your mic at me. <laughs> I just wanted, oh yeah. I just wanted to say that I am proud to have worked on Doom. And after 18-some uh, <laughs> years, I can uh, wear this shirt and uh, say that, you know, I wrote it. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, that'll be a uh, twenty bucks for another shirt to come off. If you know what I'm saying. <laughs> we actually made uh, Wolfenstein shirts that way as well. So Wolfenstein 3D wrote it, and then we did a bunch of the Doom ones while we were making the game. Uh, it's pretty funny. So yeah, yeah actually, we uh, came up with. Uh, I think I, I did the the Rota shirts, and then I did the Go to Hell ad, and then like Apple did these really simple couple word ads. I think they stole it from me personally. But. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so now we have to hire some new people, right? So uh, we just hired two more people to replace Tom. <laughs> Dave Taylor. Everybody knows Dave, hopefully. Um, and then the legendary Sandy Peterson, who uh, was uh, working with Chaosium on Call of Cthulhu and a bunch of other stuff. So he was a well-known designer back then. Um, so then uh, these guys jump on the game. Sandy is taking over Tom's design work. Dave is, is doing a lot of programming for us to get the game out. You know, we get into September. Um, we're making a lot of progress on the auto map. 
Uh, lots of levels are getting done uh, in the style of game levels back then. And uh, we get the DMX sound drivers. Uh, we, we didn't have enough bandwidth to do the sound drivers ourselves. So we actually uh, had a guy named Paul Radek. Uh, he wrote the sound drivers that he was licensing out. So Dave got those hooked into the game so we could actually get sound effects and everything. Um, in October, we finally get another build of the game. Uh, it's a pre-release, and, uh, and it's getting close. You know, we're only, uh, I think, what, two months away from release at this point. So, um, so the game's looking better. You can see way more textures in it. The lighting's better. We had a lot more time to, uh, to make more of an environment in this game. So this doesn't have the sound effects in it because it would be annoying. <laughs> but, uh, but you can see uh, how much more work's been done to that really simple level. And it does take a lot of time when you're making levels to just keep going over and over the same area and refining your texture alignment and your lighting and your effects and your placement and everything that you're trying to do in these things. Uh, making a great level requires a, a ton of iteration and a ton of play. You need to play your own level. And so I play these things a lot. And th like th this isn't even the final version of it because there's no lip there in the final, in the final game. Um, you can see that uh, even the sky is different. Uh, that's like trying to be realistic. It looks like, uh, you know, you're on Phobos and there's space above the mountains, which sure space would be black like that, but it doesn't look that good. You know, the black, a black void like that doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel as good as something that has, has more light. So we kind of made it, we, we changed the, the final, the final, uh, the final sky to actually be light colored, so the level actually felt a lot better. Yeah, if you put like stars in there, they would kind of alias or something with the. the yeah, they would or... drop out and kind of look sampley. Um, you can see that we're picking up items, we're keeping track of items, and next to the Doom guy's head, we have the lives. So uh, we still had those kind of things in the game, uh, even at the intermission screen, it was keeping track of, you know, your rewards for items that you picked up and stuff. But we. I basically just didn't think that, um, like this was a, this, like I felt like this is a pretty modern game. Let's get rid of the the things that arcade games had in them. Uh, so I didn't like the idea that uh, that you would have to have lives and like you could end the game and kind of get really mad because you tried really hard to get through like E2 M5 or something. So I got rid of the idea of uh, lives and if you get killed, you just go back to the beginning of the level infinitely as much as as, as much as you want. And we have a save load feature in the game where you can save it at any second while you're playing and reload it instantly. So it would be, you know, it, 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 there's a high probability that players will be able to actually finish the game and get through it. Um, so you can see here, uh, walking through E1 M2, uh, how much different it is. You can see that these fireballs from, from these guys are still, I think, at Tom's art. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fireballs that they're throwing is old. Um, but at least you can see the game getting getting uh, more done. And really, the next step past this point was the final game. It was just the next revision of all of these little layers of graphics and, and uh, level design and menu systems and, and stuff like that. So you can see, I uh, actually had to run a TSR program called Fake, Fake Date <laughs> to, to allow me to record the demo because we had a, a, a time-locked press release version <laughs> that we sent out, so, you know, uh, it's hard to say. I don't, I don't think you can set the date manually inside of DOSBox. Um, so going forward, November was like, okay, we're at the very end. We got to hurry up and get this game done. So we we're all doing final polish work on it. So a lot got done. The first IPX multiplayer um, in a game was created, like a fast shooter game. Uh, the word deathmatch is created. Uh, came up with that just while I was thinking about, you know, what kind of mode that would be. We put co-op in there because it just seemed obvious that you'd want to go through the, the game together with friends. Um, we finished all of the, 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 the extra 10% of the game that it takes to throw, really make it feel polished. Um, and then we got you know, modems working and all the game maps were modified to handle all the game modes that we had with all the difficulty levels and everything. So it was really just tons of polish at the very, very end. Um, and we were spending more and more time at the office the uh, Usenet was going crazy because everybody knew the game was going at, coming out for a whole year, so they were inventing all kinds of stories and, and uh, new um, games based off of cheat codes that we had. And you know, it was actually the internet created some cheat codes, uh, so it was it was just like really furious at the very end. That last November December um, was was 
was pretty crazy. Um, and then basically, that was the, December 10th is the day that we are putting the game up on the net. We had a 30-hour stretch at the very end of uh, no sleep, 30 hours, everybody just running the game on every machine. Um, we had a uh, last-minute bug that was like, it, it was a really crazy bug that uh, only if you knew everything about the technology would you know how to debug. But basically, uh, the game runs on a timer, so even in the future with you know, 50, megahertz, 50 gigahertz of processors, this game will always run at the, at the correct speed. Um, but in doing that, using the timer at, the, at a low level, uh, interrupt level, basically if the timer starts at some crazy random value when the game starts, there's a possibility that it could hit zero, and at that point the game just locks up. So we sometimes saw the game running on a bunch of machines and it would just randomly lock up for no reason at all. And, uh, and only, only uh, Carmack could figure out that it was the timer code that was wrapping when that happened. So to fix that bug and then it never, you know, that was just like during that last time uh, fixing that bug and it was the last thing that we had in the game. And so I, and ironically, <laughs> Doom is uploaded to my college yeah. <laughs> computers, University of Wisconsin. To upload too? the game to the college, uh, University of Wisconsin's <laughs> FTP server. And everyone was waiting for it. So we had to, um, you know, we had to try and get in there, get a slot in there to do an upload, which is what we did. And so, um, you know, we were using a modem and <laughs> putting the game up. And, uh, <laughs> totally couldn't hear. And it blew up the whole server. <laughs> and uh, and then we had to get on the phone with the sysop of the, of the FTP server. And then we had to have him kick everybody off. And then we had to slot in again because we had hundreds of people trying to get onto the server to get the game. And we couldn't even get the game up on the server because they were sitting there. And then it blew up again. So the second time the game blew up and, and, uh, and then basically had to tell him to just lock everybody off so we could just upload it. And so he did that. And now Bucky's happy. And then yeah. the game was uploaded, <laughs> uploaded to the world and made its way across all the BBSs and uh, you know everybody knows the rest of the story. Um, we went on to make Doom 2 and Quake. And, and that weirdly, uh, level 10 of Doom 2 is mine. <laughs> I, kept some I, actually, levels I actually got it and was just playing and was like, what the, the diamonds, what that? <laughs> it was a funny moment. Anyway. Yep. So that's it. That's the story of how we made Doom. Um, <laughs> thanks, everyone. We can do, uh, well, questions. first of all, I would like it to, this is an odd job. And really like to thank everybody that like gets the games and downloads them because you're just kind of like sitting in a room doing like this thing because you like to play it. You know, it's like I want to play that thing, and then all of a sudden, oh, this is really great. It's like, I, you know, okay, <laughs> nice to meet you. I don't know how this happened, but it's it's kind of cool. So questions? Uh, anybody has questions? Uh, it'd be Five great minutes. to hit hit a microphone so, so everyone can hear. Uh, so to me, one of the sort of most interesting dynamics in Doom was the uh, variety and sort of enemy attacks um, and just sort of the timings of them and so on. I was curious as to kind of where along the process or how much, did they come out the way you'd planned or was there a lot of change throughout in terms of like fireball speeds and enemy run speeds and shotgun timing and whatnot? Um, yeah, everything in the game was totally iterated on like heavily. We had, you know, we made really best first guesses uh, the game in the, the game frame rate, the, the rendering rate was locked at 35 frames a second, even though it could probably go 70. We made it 35, so the rest of the, the, the game would run evenly on more systems, and that the uh, and we ran the internal AI at 10 frames a second, so we would have a, a good a good speed for the enemies. We don't want them coming too fast because it's just not very fair or fun. So uh, we put first guess values in for everything, the damage, uh, how the damage scales on weapons, the weapon firing rates, how much per second damage that could possibly be, um, to try and perfectly balance all the weapons. So, you know, what you were having to decide was, if something's really far away, you want to use not the shotgun. <laughs> and if something is, is uh, big, you want to use the rocket launcher and, and uh, stuff that's really far away, use the pistol or the chain gun. Uh, so we, we, we did a ton of balancing on that to try and kind of even out the damages and the times that they would fire. And, we, and, and uh, I'd have to say it just felt perfect, uh, you know, even, even years later when you play Deathmatch in other games and come back to it, it just, it's, it just we got really lucky balancing uh, all the damage. Thank you. I can't see you over there. I guess there's a hand. 
over there. Hi. Hi there. Um, so now ah. that the game is, well, the game has been finished for a while and ported for a lot of systems, do you guys go back and think that there was any element that you want to change? And also, which port do you think is the best and the most best representation of the game? Um, I, don't, I've, I don't have anything that I want to change other than, you know, uh, it, I, would, I would go over the levels probably and just do some more polish on the levels. Um, but they really, they, they, they feel great and uh, I think the game is, I, I really don't have any, like, I don't look back at it and go, oh man, that was really messed up. Like in, you know, with Quake there was, there was some damages with the rocket launcher I would probably change. But, uh, but with Doom it just seemed right. Um, Him? Yeah, I guess I got one, one more question. Yeah. Uh, hello, I'm Carlos. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks. I recently read Masters of Doom, and uh, it reminded me of uh, kind of like a, when I was growing up, like the image that people had of John Romero, like, you know, someone that was very excited, very passionate about what he was doing. Uh, one of the things that I thought about was how you guys always wanted to make, like, the best games around you. You wanted to compete with the greatest, and you wanted to break new ground and, you know, make the you know, use like Carmack's technology and apply it in design in ways that nobody had seen before. Um, and you then, when you disagree with, uh, I think it, I, I saw a YouTube uh, interview with Matt, like Matt Chat. Matt Chat, yeah. Yeah, where you uh, dis you say you disagree with uh, some of the decisions that were made in Quake and you ended up, you know, doing your own thing. And you still wanted to, you know, make your own, you know, great first person shooter and your, your vision of it. Right. Um, so as a creator, what made you transition from, you know, that passion towards, say, AAA games towards a different focus now towards, a, say, social space? Um, well, I, I played Deathmatch, like, constantly for years and love Deathmatch. I really, it, it, Deathmatch is, like, one of the most fun uh, ways to play a game for me. Um, but nowadays, going into the, uh, into the, the latest games, they're not, they don't feel the same way. They feel like, I feel like I'm going slower through the world, and I really like the Doom and Quake speeds of, you know, player run. It felt like uh, they're more skill-based than, you know, like, uh, than, than just, like, aiming at somebody with a, with a railgun. Um, not, not as much fun for me. Uh, and, uh, and as a designer, uh, it's way more challenging to make a game that, you know, hundreds of millions of people will like. Uh, like say social games, it's much more of a challenge to try and uh, get back to what you know the roots of, of what's fun and to make it palatable to way more people. Um, so I still I still have some really great ideas for some shooters that I'd like to make, um, but right now um, you know I've I've moved through we both moved through a lot of yeah. different kinds of designs in, in our careers and, and uh, it's fun to touch a lot of different areas. Well, I think I think John's genius is seeing the, the, the next thing, and, and it, perhaps the timing has been off occasionally, but when Carmack and I made a joke first level of Super Mario and left it on John's desk, he closed the door when we came in after you know crashing and stuff, and he says, we are out of here. <laughs> he knew it. They said, this is it. We're out of here. Boom. This is, this is a success. It was scrolling. And yeah, with the tile scrolling stuff. And when uh, we did Monkey Stone together, it's like it was a very early cell thing. The cell carriers didn't really have it together as far as games, but that's that's the biggest thing now is you know mobile games and stuff. So it was brilliant, a little early on that one, and uh, now it's striking the forefront again with social games and, and sharing it with Brenda, the brilliant Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I think that's it for questions because we have to run to another talk. Yes. Thanks, everybody.